So I guess that's why the story can't stay the same because there were parts of that story that we just didn't like and it needed a new ending. So in case people haven't noticed, there seems to be um, plenty of, and I'm going to stay up here because otherwise I have to pay attention to keeping the mic close enough to my mouth and speaking and um, speaking clearly and coherently. So I'm gonna do my best with coherent. It's been a while since I've preached, I'm retired. And uh, so I will stand up here though. But it seems like we live in a world where one of the ways that people maintain their power structures and don't want things to change is by robbing people of their joy. That, you know, there are so many ways in which we can be joyful and children can be joyful in their classes. And we hear about the Canaanite woman and she's concerned about her daughter. And it seems like over and over again, there are stories about, you know, like the, the Pharisees, Jesus talks about having them fall into a pit. And unfortunately, I think that we have some um, politicians and leaders that would be really nice to um, have them have their own little place somewhere else with the Pharisees, and unfortunately, many of them continue to be elected. So, out of so much, from whether we're talking about governors to school boards, we have stories like this. There's a teacher outside of Atlanta that read a storybook to her fifth grade children. Fifth grade, the, the, the kids that were sort of in the class where they really um, need a lot of um, the, 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 the bright, you know, the kids that they call um, gifted. I, I'm just struggling with that word though, but I think we know that they're bright kids and they have high levels of thinking. And so she read them a book called My Shadow is Purple. Well, My Shadow is Purple is a book about gender and gender neutrality and non-binary themes. And part of why the book is called My Shadow is Purple is because in the book, mom's shadow is pink and dad's shadow is green and the child's shadow is purple. And afterwards, Miss Rendell asks the kids to write a poem about their shadow. Well, can anybody predict what happened? Fired. She got fired. Yeah, in spite of former retired teachers and a number of people coming forward, this teacher lost her job because she read a story book to children and gave them an opportunity to understand gender and non-binary gender and ways that are just fluid and that gave them a chance to think about how they would draw their own shadow and she lost her job. And so we know when we hear stories like that, things, the story has to change. And our prayer time this morning, all of the smoke and the fires, so much of it caused by the, the, the climate change, we know the story needs to change. And when we can celebrate, and this is where the story did change, that we can celebrate marriage for everyone that wants to marry the person they love. We hear the story changing and we celebrate that. And at the same time, we know that there are people that are not happy about this. So, I'd like us to just spend a little bit of time with this text today because I think it's one of those in which Jesus tries to get the word out that the story needs to change. That there are people that are clinging to the law and not in a way that we believe Moses meant the law to be presented. The law was, you know, back in the days of Moses and the Ten Commandments and all of those things, a way of keeping the people that were wandering in the desert somewhat a little more cohesive. Um, everybody here, I'm pretty sure, knows that 
um, Christianity comes from Judaism, and Judaism came out of a group of tribal people wandering the desert. And so some of the things that seemed to matter in the desert, um, like what you ate, and some of the laws, well, Jesus is alive and present, and I want to I see this really clearly. Jesus is going, this isn't what the laws are about. The laws are about the big things, like what we've heard today from Isaiah, that God smiles and we know joy when people that aren't normally accepted, people from other places, people that are seen differently, whatever it is, it keeps people separate. When they're brought together and able to come and pray together, there is what? Joy. Joy. Joy on God's holy mountain, joy in the holy spaces of worship, joy in prayer, and joy in life. And so Jesus, I think Jesus liked a good meal. I mean, think about the stories in the Bible, changes wine from water, um, broke bread with all kinds of people, and he really didn't care as to whether somebody kept the dietary laws or if they were a tax collector or anything else. Jesus went and ate with anybody that invited him and actually quite often I think he invited himself. So uh, so he you know kind of keys into these things with the dietary laws and the Pharisees and how they're using them to keep people separate. It's more than about whether you are a vegan or paleo or whether you eat low fat or high fat or dairy and non-dairy or you have food sensitivities or anything else. It's, um, I am actually taking care of cats this week, and one of the cats gets food that is called um, human for human consumption, safe for human consumption. And so I'm pretty sure that if you've ever eaten at some fast food places, that probably the quality of the food is not as good as what this cat is eating that comes frozen in the mail. Or you know, So one of the things, I have a food sensitivity. I am sensitive to soy and zucchini. I can't eat either one of them. They give me all kinds of digestive things. And also, some are squash. And every so often, some of say, well, are you sure? Have you tried some, some others? And I once had pristine soy made in a monastery up on a hill in Japan, <laughs> and it made me sick. I had zoodles one time, and they didn't work. And then after a while, I thought, no, wait a minute, we are not talking chocolate. We're not talking french fries. How often should I try and see if soy and zucchini agree with me? <laughs> yeah, yes, I've done it, and I'm not done with that particular experiment. So, so Jesus, Jesus actually sort of brings this joyful news, like, it's not what you eat, folks. You'll be okay. If you didn't get your hands washed, if you forgot to bring the sanitizer with you, it will be all right. And so there's probably these people thinking differently and they're a little more excited and a little more, and the Pharisees are like, oh no, that's not okay. Oh my God, it's going against the law and everything else. And so they don't say to Jesus, they just instead are talking to the people that Jesus is trying to influence. And Jesus is really clear that he's trying to make a point because at the beginning he says, hear this and understand it. Yeah, pay attention. I want you to get this. It isn't what we eat that defiles us. And he goes on to um, listen to what the, the disciples say about the Pharisees and how upset they are. And he's like, you still don't get it. Now, this is like after he had walked on water. They had this opportunity to feed 5,000 people if we were to look earlier in Matthew. And they haven't quite caught up yet. And it's like, it's not what goes in your mouth, it's what comes out. And don't we all know it? How many times have we hurt someone else's feelings or said something we wish we hadn't or we have felt terribly wounded or felt our hearts break for others that we see being verbally attacked far more than by the food we eat? I mean, there's a whole list of things that Jesus says can come from our hearts, can come from our minds, and those are the things that we need to pay attention to. 
that we need to turn our hearts, our minds, our souls towards God to open our being up to that holy presence and let go of the other stuff because when we're speaking from a place where we're coming from love and compassion, that's when the world is the world that I think God dreams of. And God knows that all of us are capable of more love than I think we imagine. And certainly we know that in listening to the stories of the world right now, that there is work to be done. And so this story that follows, kind of follows for a reason. There, there, there's a connection there. And, and it might be that Jesus needed to have another way of teaching. Like, you know, he's, he's spoken. He said, here's what defiles. Here's what's okay. Here's what's fine. But they still aren't understanding. So later he's gone to a different place where there's more people from um, that are, are not um, the people of Israel that are not understanding all of Pharisaic laws. And this Syrophoenician woman comes to visit and she wants Jesus to help her daughter. And some people think that maybe what happens in this story is that Jesus realizes that he is holding God's presence and he has a change of heart and that could be but it could also be that Jesus realized that if he sort of um, treated this woman the way they expected her to be treated he would have their attention do you think he got their attention mm -hmm. and they thought he was paying attention because we hear they were annoyed this woman is bothering us. We've been traveling. We're having dinner. We're annoyed, Jesus. And Jesus says, well, you know what? Yeah, we can't do this. You know, I came for the people of Israel. So sorry. You know, I'll just go off and go have whatever scraps. And then she's so humble. She, she just has nothing but humility. And, and Jesus says, says, wait, and do you think they took notice when that happened? Do you think the disciples that were sitting around being annoyed took notice when Jesus makes this shift, like from, no, I can't help you, to your faith. You showed up with faith. You showed up with a willingness to ask for that which you needed for your daughter, I will make your child well. That maybe part of this was Jesus knew all along what was going to happen and it was devastating at first, but he makes the shift and he heals the young woman. And so what I believe changes us, changes the world and everything else, is when we can be open with our hearts, our minds, and I've said it before, and what Jesus does here, this woman is so open, she is so guileless, she is so willing, and Jesus says, okay, it will be done. And we don't know whether he just recognized his own divinity and said yes, or if he just totally wanted, my gosh, the disciples, come on, let's get with it. It could be one or the other, but we know in the end, he heals her. And so the thing that I would ask us to take away in all of this, take away in all of this is that what we do in the world matters, how we vote, how we spend our dollars, how we talk to people. Um, all of the, our activism, all of those things. But the, to make everything that we do have as much power as possible is to bring forth the spiritual gifts that God has given us. To bring forward love, to bring forward faith and compassion and mercy and joy. That's what's going to bring 
God's world into existence. And I'm going to, I'm seeing, I'm running over a little bit. Are you people that have to walk out the door at 11.30? So one of the places where I just experienced God's love in my life and joy is um, my 21-year-old niece died of a drug overdose just before Thanksgiving in 2017. My brother lived in Massachusetts. He and her mom were not together. And my parents and I all, as soon as we could, got to Massachusetts to be with my brother. And they wanted to have a service, even though Stephen had not, my brother had not been, you know, practicing in any church. And so I went about looking for a church and thought about the one in the town where we used to live, the town where my brother lived, and I knew that there would be a number of people that Melanie went to high school with. And so I called an old friend and said, can you think of a church that might be open to having a memorial service for somebody that's not a member that died of a drug overdose? And they said, try this church. So this is the Friday after Thanksgiving. I talked to my friend on Saturday. I drive out to look at the church. There's a car in the parking lot. The office manager who never usually worked on a Saturday was there. The office manager was there working that day. And I knocked on the door and she let me in. And I explained what was going on. And she called the pastor. And Pastor Judy said, give her a key to the church. And so we had, and it was a church that welcomed foreigners. They welcomed especially people from communities where they were persecuted countries, where LGBTQ people were persecuted. This church dripped of welcome. And so when our family needed welcome, we got it. And that alone would be enough, but I knew that God's hand was there. And this doesn't just happen to me. All of you have these kinds of stories. Was that when my brother was saying, oh, um, Melanie's aunt is going to do the music. She's the musician of some church and she'll do the music. And he couldn't remember her name or anything else. And I look at my email that night and Melanie's Aunt Nicole was the musician for that church that I happened to walk into where they said, of course, you can have the service here. And so I can tell you in my own family that when people show up in that open-hearted way, there was joy even in the midst of deep sorrow. And I could say things to the young people that um, that how, you know, in this life, sometimes we, we're just impacted by this world and that there was a picture behind me of Jesus holding the sheep. And I said, you know, I think about Melanie as now she's in a place where she's no longer addicted and that she is free and that Jesus isn't walking around carrying her in his arms. Jesus has put Melanie down on the ground and said, you are free, little lamb, you are free. And the kids could hear that, that it wasn't a punishment or any, it was that she was now free from what contained her in this life. And two months later, I walked out of a retreat and I saw that picture of the sheep and I saw a young gal with blonde hair like Melanie's and, and I caught the back of her pink t-shirt and Melanie always loved pink, even before the Barbie movie. And on the back of it, it said, love wins. We have assistance from realms that we do not know. Love wins, Christ is with us. The Spirit will lead us and be with us always, regardless of what the world keeps trying to throw at us. We just keep showing up and praying and dancing and singing and keeping our hearts open. Thanks be to Holy God. Amen.